I'm Perry Martini, I'm an elder here at Mariner's Church, and I must tell you, if you're new to the church, you don't know this, but Gene and I have been coming in to Mariner's since the very beginning in November of 1997, so in the Navy we call those plank owners. As I look around, Navy people will understand what I mean. I also would tell you that in preparing for a sermon to give towards this church, that it's a lot of work, yes, but what I noticed this morning, and I always do, is a greater appreciation, not only for Pastor Bill, who week after week in his expository sermons puts the word and spreads the good news about the gospel, but all the support staff that helps Bill put this together so that you can enjoy the sermon and listen to the sermon on the slides, the sound in the back, the people that are involved in taping it. It's just an amazing staff that just does things on automatic, and I'm very grateful for that. And always, as I get up in front of you, I always have to give that appreciation for them. If you're a visitor here for the first time or you haven't been around for a while, you may not know that this is the last in the series of Women in the Bible, or what the, we call the Five Guys Sermon Series. Now, two years ago, in 2017, five of us presented sermons from five guys from the Old Testament. Last year, in 2000 and 2018, we presented five guys from the New Testament. Well, this will be the final in the series of Women in the Bible who had great impact on our lives which started with Mary Magdalene by Pastor Fry, and then Deborah by Pastor Fowler, and then Ruth by J.D. Walker, and last week, Esther by my fellow elder, Bob Riera. Today I have the opportunity for the grand finale, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now my sermon today is gonna to be very personal. I share my journey as a believer that began, frankly, late in life uh, when I was in my late 30s, almost 40. Matter of fact, the song, How Great There Art, was one I had heard as a, as a young boy but didn't realize what it meant until I walked into a church that was basically a believing church that understood what God was. Much like the sermons on the women of great in the Bible, each of us has mentioned those women in our lives who have had the greatest impact. I am no different. I had a mother by the name of Angelina, which by the way in Italian means little angel, which she was, Maria Martini, and my paternal grandmother, my nona Raffaella, who both raised me to believe in Almighty God and our Lord and Savior by living the values at home of the Christian life. Now, I can't go without mentioning that in my immediate family was my, the one person who was probably most influential when it came to my faith, and that was my late sister, Maria, Marie Martini. She passed away five years ago this year, and she went way too soon to be with her Lord at the age of 71, which happens to be now my age. Another woman of impact in those early years was my maternal grandmother, who was in the house with me also, whose name was Maria Pietra Catello my mother's mother. All were wonderful women, and if you paid attention, who had ironically the name Mary, or its derivative, Maria Maria in Italian, as their first or middle name. But even though all these women had great impact in my life growing up, none other than my wife and my love of my life, my wife Jean Marie, however, is one of the greatest impact, who came alongside with me in my journey to help me find the truth in Holy Scriptures by introducing me and working together in the true word of God by understanding this owner's manual, which she has inscribed on the first page some 30 years ago. So on that note, I will begin with this word in the morning. So you have your Bible ready, please grab it. And if you don't have one, there's one in the, in the pew in front of you or the seat in front of you. And essentially, hmm, give me a second. On, off. I learned that in the Navy. Basically, um, what I want to talk about basically is underneath your seats and in your, again, your Bibles. And if you turn to your Bibles, I'll tell you where to turn to here in a moment because I'm going to stay pretty much in the same section today. But I want to talk about the Bible and why it's important for us to use the Bible on our daily prayer time and also always. You see, our mission here at Mariner's exists for the glory of God by proclaiming the grace through helping people know the truth, which is right here in front of me, and growing a community and going to serve. The truth is written in what Bill 
McKinney, Pastor Bill talks about, is the owner's manual. And one of my pastors back in my hometown, Warren, Ohio, always talks about if you want to hear what God's saying, open the Bible. That's when his mouth is going. If you don't want to hear what he has to say, close his mouth. So it's important you keep the Bible open often. So please turn to Luke chapter 1, and I'll get started. I'm going to be following the outline in the, uh, the handout that you got today somewhat. Uh, it's pretty blank, as you noticed. Uh, you can fill in some notes if you want as they go through the Bible verses, but also I'll have a, on the second page a fill in the blank at the end on some takeaways from my message. But first, let me tell you a quick story as you're turning to Luke. Uh, Dr. Pat Robertson was one, is one of my mentors. Pat Robinson is the president chancellor emeritus today of CBN University, which is now called Regent University. And I was uh, part of the adjunct faculty and still am today. And I went to a seminar he gave for the faculty about eight summers ago. And he spoke to all of us and basically challenged us that when we introduced ourselves as part of Regent University, we don't introduce ourselves on what we do. We introduce ourselves on who we are. And he gave an example. Hi, I'm Dr. Pat Robinson. I've been saved by my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm a Christian first. Then he goes on with this, what he does. And all of us kind of sat there squeamishing because none of us do it. As I challenge all of you, I would share, I would quick to say, none of you do. Maybe you're the pastor here and that's what you talk about first. That's important, but we don't do it. We just don't do it. This is really kind of the story lying and the theme of my sermon. It's not what you do, it's who you are. So I begin my sermon by stating the absolute inevitable. Mary was not only the most famous person in the history of the world, but also that Mary was one of the noblest characters in the entire Bible. She is a wonderful role model for all women, especially mothers, and she deserves to be honored as such. In this morning's ABF series, we talked about Mary quite a bit, obviously, and I asked everybody, what was their first thoughts of Mary? What was their visual of Mary? What did they know about Mary? Many of you probably the same. It was that person figurehead in the manger and the nativity scene underneath the Christmas tree, perhaps. Or maybe you saw the Charlie Brown Christmas story. You saw something where you saw Mary that we visualize as a caricature of the mother of Jesus. Now, my own personal reflection on Mary is what I was exposed to as a young boy in my understanding of her place in history as the mother of Jesus. I feel certain as I state the following words that I'm not the only one worshiping today that had this same experience growing up. For example, we really don't know how, Mary, how old Mary was when she became the mother of Jesus, but there's a degree of agreement that she was very young, more likely a teenager. We know she had reached the age of puberty, obviously, and there was probably a good sense to know from history that she was very young, 13, 14, 15, but we really don't know. Some of us were taught she never had any children in life to remain a virgin until her death. That's what we were taught. Some of us were taught she uh, was misguided stories of her even being as far as part of the deity and lived without sin. I must admit these early experiences that I was taught, and these are the most egregious, these stories, that Mary was literally nowhere to be found when I finally was introduced to this. Some 30 years later, and I actually read it, the light came on for me as a Christian. Mary was not who I thought she was but actually something far more beautiful as a human being just like you and me. This was quite revealing, as I stated part of my personal journey as a true believer, quite revealing. To further emphasize this chasm in the, church, the world of churches, this understanding, some people throughout the history of Christianity have mistakenly elevated Mary, as I just stated in their thinking, to a position not taught to us in the Bible, but others have gone to the further extreme by just completely approaching it and no, ignoring her. She deserves better than either of these extremes. And the Bible has given us a glimpse into her personality, her strength of character, that surpasses any other woman in the entire history of our world. It's important we focus on what is written about Mary, the mother of Jesus, and put our understanding in the context of the Bible, the truth, the evidence that I've been able to verify over and over again, and today I will confirm it by stating my case. Remember, it's not important of what you do or what you did, or who you are, or who you were. To this point regarding Mary, there are three, tra three traits that Mary possessed I'd like to focus on this morning. The first of that is her purity of character. Undoubtedly, she was not only a role model for mothers, 
see today as a role model for unmarried women and teenage girls. Let's start by turning to chapter, uh, Luke chapter 1. And again, I plan to stay in the New Testament in Luke. So in order to have a grasp of these passages, it is important we understand in Luke 1, it's the story of how the angel Gabriel revealed to the aged priest, Zechariah, that his wife Elizabeth would give birth to a son and that his son would be John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus. So in chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, now in the sixth month, as I read, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged, I'm sorry, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary, or in my culture, Maria, okay? She was engaged, the Bible said, she was engaged to a man named Joseph. Now, some Bible verses, mine especially, has espoused. Some have betrothed. But in those days, to be espoused, espoused, engaged, or betrothed was far different from modern-day engagement. Now, hear me out on this. Betrothal and engagement in those days was considered to be just as binding as a marriage, as, even though the couple were forbidden to have sexual intimacy during the betrothal period, in fact, it was so binding that the betrothal couple were spoken of as husband and wife, and the only way the engagement could be broken was by divorce. Now, that's what 2,000 plus years ago. We need to remember that Mary was not divine, and she was a mere mortal, just like you and me. Then as now, temptation abounded in many ways as a young girl, but she kept herself clean and pure. And in Thessalonians it reads, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual morality. Now today's world, as we know it, looks upon this as foolish and foolhardy, that men and women to be abstained from being married to, to their true love. Moral relativism, which I've spoken about this at this pulpit, has prevailed in our 20th and 21st century. This is a huge fallacy that the idea that moral, rel moral values are somewhat relative, they are not. Regardless of what we in the past two or three generations have taught, and I count myself in this, there are, is in this world moral absolutes. They're in here. The weak need some years ago proclaimed that, hey, everybody's doing it, what's the big deal? And essentially admitted the existence of this lie from the depths of hell himself and Satan. Now many have brought into this lie but without forgiveness and repentance have lived the life with the consequences of their actions. Mary was a role model, not only for this purity of character, but also for mothers because of the second trait that God had given her, and that was her obedience to God. So we read further in Luke, chapter 1, verses 28 through 37. The angel went to her and said, and coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, can you imagine this? How can this be? I'm a virgin. The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child should be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And she is called barren. And who was called barren is now in her sixth month. For nothing will be impossible with God. I repeat, nothing will be impossible with God. Keep that in mind. So let's refocus and reread verse 35. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The incarnation was accomplished by the creative act by God of the Holy Spirit, the body of Mary. In the body of Mary. The virgin birth was a special miracle performed by the third person of the Trinity and the Holy Spirit, whereby the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Son of God, took himself to be a genuine, though sinless, human nature and born as the Son of Man without surrendering in any aspect his true deity. This is the core, the essential core 
of our belief system, which many who do not believe this cannot wrap their heads around. Now, as I read further, verse 38, Mary said, Behold the bond slave of the Lord. May it be done according to your word. And then the angel departed from her. We believe now, as we look back on this, that Mary did not fully comprehend what God's angels had said to her. Imagine having something like this happen to you and appear to you. You're stunned, you're shocked. We do know from Mary's upbringing that she was versed in the Bible, versed in the Old Testament, that someday somebody was going to bear the Messiah. But she understood in it part, but yet she completely did not grasp what was really in store for her. Yet her life was surrendered to God in that very moment when she said, Lord, whatever you will for my life, so be it, whether I understand it or not. This is an act of absolute, total obedience. Further in Luke, in chapters four, and verse, uh, Luke 1, verses 46, 47, we read, And Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. These two verses, although we're not going to read them this morning, are followed by ten verses, eight additional verses that form a poem called the Magnificat. What is interesting here is there in these ten verses, or eight verses, there are discernible, 15 discernible quotations from the Old Testament in this very poem. This is Mary speaking out loud to Elizabeth by those eight verses about her wonderment over what was happening. She was quoting the Old Testament. We should take note that Mary's godliness shows in this encounter with Elizabeth that she was well-versed in what was in the Bible in the Old Testament. Some of you may recall the story of Samuel last year and his mother, Hannah, during our uh, presentation on, on Samson, Samuel. Hannah had no children and was abused by other women because of it, and she prayed earnestly that the Lord would give her a son, and he did. Well, and I would like you to write this one down. It might be in your Bible, in your uh, uh, brown sheet handout. First Samuel 2, Hannah sings a song of praise, which is very familiar and similar to Mary's song of praise in Luke 46 to 56. Folks, Mary was well-versed in the Old Testament. She almost quotes her verbatim from the Old Testament. Mary was a wonderful, clean, and blessed young woman, but nevertheless, like the rest of it, had fallen short of the glory of God. Sexually pure, yes, but a sinner in many other ways. Thus, we know Mary needed a savior, just as you and I did and do. No doubt she was very familiar with the Old Testament prophecies from Isaiah 53, 5 through 6. He was pierced with our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being felt upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Now Mary had put her faith in God's promised redeemer as she was growing up that would one day come to save the people of their sins. And now she can hardly contain herself as the angel tells her she is going to be the human vessel to whom the Christ promise will enter the world. That's the basic explanation as to why Mary was such a wonderful role model for mothers because at that moment she was saved. Mary was saved by her Lord and Savior. That's the number one requirement for anyone, as you know, to be the kind of person God intends you to be. Be saved. Be sure you've yielded yourself. Be faithful, repentant, and always to the Lord Jesus Christ. So not only was Mary saved, she was a tremendous woman of prayer. One of the red-letter days in Christian history was in the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out into mighty power and several thousand people, as we know from Acts, was saved on that one single day. But in the secret of Pentecost was that prior to that day, a group of faithful believers prayed long and fervently. Several of those persons are named in Acts 1.13 and 1.14. When they entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. That is Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, Judas the son of James. These were all these all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. We 
pretty no, much no that the next day the same group was gathered when the Pentecost came upon them, when the Holy Spirit came upon them. Mary was present. Mary, the mother of Jesus, the son of man, who was obedient to God, and then the Holy Spirit. The, the Trinity was completed when she received the Holy Spirit and saved along with the rest of the apostles and the others that were in that room. Thank the Lord for praying mothers. My late mom, Angelina Martini, prayed consistently that I would not crash my Navy P-3 aircraft while I served in the Navy for 32 years. She was petrified of my becoming a Navy pilot. My sister Marie told me that while I was flying in various squadrons, no matter what day it was or where or when she would pray, every single day that I would land safely and not crash over the ocean, because she had to make the assumption I was flying somewhere someday. She did, not, she did not have my schedule, my flight schedule, but she had the flight schedule to God and to Jesus and prayed. No doubt in my mind that my mother's prayers were added value to my sur surrounding and protecting me with many angels sent by Jesus in flight to keep me safe. I had a lot of incidents where I wondered if somebody was praying for me because I survived it. I know now and looking back, my mother had a lot to do with that by praying to Jesus. There's a third reason that Mary was a wonderful role model, in particular as a mother to her precious son, and that was her devotion to Jesus. I personally have no doubt whatsoever that she was deeply devoted to her other children, all of whom were conceived after the birth of Jesus. It's written in Matthew 125. Joseph kept her a virgin until she gave birth to the son, and he called his name Jesus. But the purpose of the New Testament is to present Jesus, not Mary's other children. So the Bible tells us about Mary and what kind of mother she was, but the Bible primarily deals with the relationship she had to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, her total devotion. Even though Mary experienced great blessing and joy in being the mother of Jesus, she also experienced heartache, not inflicted by Jesus, to be sure, but heartache nonetheless. We learn in Luke 2 that when Jesus was just a few days old, Joseph and Mary took him to this Jerusalem for a ceremony, which they presented him to the Lord. Probably very similar to what we do here at Mariners when we have babies at the dedication service. Realize it's not baptism. Baptism comes later on by John the Baptist. In Luke 2, 26, 30, we read about him. And it was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's, seen the Lord's Christ. And he came into the temple, in the spirit, into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law. Then he took him into his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to the word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Think about that. What a powerful moment that Mary must have known. She must have known, but we don't know. We always ask ourselves, Mary, did you know? Now, reading further in verses 30, 30, 30 35, and his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel, and for a sign to be opposed. And a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. If you really tear, if you really tear this apart about parents, then dare not to hurt one of your children. So I know for a fact, those of you that are parents, something happens to your child, you were hurt as well. That's the way fathers feel about it, and that's also the way mothers feel. It must have crushed Mary to see her son misunderstood, falsely accused, mistreated, rejected by so many. She must have been deeply pained at her own inability to comprehend much of what Jesus said and what he did. Because Jesus never sinned, she didn't experience the same heartaches that most of us parents experience, but make no mistake about it, she had her own set of heartaches. There's also another type of hurt that I believe Mary experienced, remembering Joseph's reaction when he first learned Mary was pregnant. In the book of Matthew, in chapter 1, it's written in verse 19 through 25, and Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call him Jesus. He will save his people from the sins. Now, all this took place to fulfill what has been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God will be with us. 
And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife. But he kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. Now, it took a special appearance, a marquee appearance by an angel to convince Joseph that Mary was not a fallen woman. Think about this, guys. Okay, yeah, sure. And somebody had to hit him by a, with a two-by-four, and the angel came to him in his sleep and said, no, no, not so fast. It's okay. You can marry her. But the other people throughout the community had no such angelic revelation. <laughs> All they had was Joseph and Mary's word, and they probably said, yeah, sure. Thus, human nature, be it what it is, in all likelihood, Mary was the subject of a lot of whispering and gossiping. She bravely persevered, knowing in her heart she was not guilty as charged, and rejoicing in the one time in history miraculous privilege that was now hers. But that great privilege, notwithstanding, Mary was human, and it must have hurt her deeply to have lived under such a cloud of suspicion. There's also another unique challenge Mary faced. Think of the tremendous sense of obligation that continued to weigh upon her. Although much of the time she did not fully comprehend the wondrous nature of the child she had born, and we often ask, did she know? At other times, did she seem to understand? They must have felt an awesome responsibility to say and do the right things in raising this sinless person called Jesus. But it said to her credit, the glory of God, the Lord's grace, she along with Joseph met the challenge. For instance, apparently they regularly took him to the house of God for worship because when Joseph was a grown man, Luke 14, 4, 16 says of him, as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. It is logical to assume that he learned that custom from Mary and Jesus. Another example of Mary's motherly concern is seen in Luke 2, in the record of Joseph and Mary taking Jesus to Jerusalem to observe the Passover feast when he was only 12 years old. On their trip back from Nazareth to, um, to, Nazareth, to Nazareth from Jerusalem, somehow they got lost track of Jesus. How that happened, we don't know. It took them three days to find them. Imagine the alarm that must have filled Mary's heart and Joseph's too as they looked for Jesus, especially when you think about what they knew about him. Fearing all sorts of horrible things might have happened to him that would detract from the prophecies to be fulfilled. But finally they found him back in Jerusalem. Put that concern in today's context just for a moment. You're traveling from Annapolis to Springfield, Virginia, 60 miles, about the same distance from Nazareth to Jerusalem. Imagine you're riding a caravan of buses and your 12-year-old son is with other children on another bus boarding at a junior high school and all of you are going on a school, full trip, school field trip in Annapolis, uh, Springfield. When you arrive, your son does not get off the bus. You panic for three days until you discover he's back in Annapolis teaching a class on physics at a local high school because, see, he's gifted in the science of physics. He got off the bus when he found out there was a special seminar and he got involved. Far-fetched, yes, cell phones being what they are. We would have known. But think about the panic Joseph and Mary went through, not finding him for three long days, and then they find him as follows. It's written in Luke 22, 46 to 47. Then after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them, asking them questions, and all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Verse 48 continues, when they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated this life this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. Continuing in verse 49, he said to them, why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? So this was a revelation to Mary all of a sudden. Or did she already know this day would come? Wouldn't it be great to ask her, Mary, did you know at this point? that he was in his father's house and not Joseph's house. Verses 50 and 52, they did not understand the statement which, which he had made to them. Why is it that you're looking for me? But what they did understand and went down with them and came to Nazareth and he continued in subjection to them and his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom from the age of 12 and in stature and in favor with God and men. So as we are told by the word, Mary experienced pain and discomfort because she was human. No one in history of motherhood endured the pain and agony she experienced eventually by Jesus' brutal death. Let's fast forward. Jesus betrayed by Judas, arrested by soldiers, put through a mock trial. It broke her heart to see all this. We know she was an eyewitness. She stood by while Jesus was crucified. It must have been soul-wrenching for her. 
This loving mother to have stand by helplessly as her precious son, this sinless man, was maligned, spat upon, ridiculed, and crucial, cr cruelly put to death. As she looked at Jesus through tear-blinded eyes, she must have remembered the words in age Simeon, a sword shall pierce through my own soul also. While dying on the cross, Jesus paid a final lasting tribute to his mother, who cared for him from the day one. Turning to John, as we read in John verse, uh, chapter 19, 26, 27, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. Now, I talked about the visual you had this morning, the manger, right, earlier. Now we have a visual that was created by the famous artist and sculptor of Italian heritage, Michelangelo Bonarotti. That's his last name, by the way, that most people don't use. He crafted, over the years of time, the Pieta, which if you see it today, either a photo or in person, it is Mary holding her son in her arms. So we have that visual, that manger vision of the animals surrounding and the three kings and having Mary hold on to her own baby, her own son. And then we have the death of the son and how he held, her, held him in her arms, tearfully knowing that it was the right thing to do after having so much devotion to him and raising it. But she knew it had come to pass and it happened. So my conclusion, let's look back and consider this amazing event, not only in history, but how God in his infinite wisdom and purpose decided to send his only son to be made from flesh through the personhood of Mary. Consider that we are born of our mothers in their image and likeness and that our human features resemble those of mothers and fathers as well. We do not know what Jesus looked like. For that matter, we don't know what Mary looked like. Rather, we do know that Jesus acted and projected those traits and characteristics that was the same of God. So did Jesus resemble Mary's human features? Resoundingly, perhaps, yes. He was human. So was she. Did Mary see Joseph growing up as a boy that looked like her? But wait, not like Joseph. Maybe it was like Joseph. Did she wonder as to the image of the likeness of the true Almighty that she actually saw in Jesus' persona, the way he acted without sin? Actually, this is not a curious question or a rhetorical one, for if you look in Genesis 1.26, God said, let us make man in our, our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and all over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God's word, that the buzzword in this verse is us, U-S, our image and likeness. The Holy Spirit in, is included in this as well right? And Mary became the woman that carried and gave birth to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It was her and her alone that was the honored privilege. So what we have learned today about this wonderful and most well-known woman of the Bible, the last in the Five Guys series for this summer about women in the Bible and the impact they had, if you would turn to your little leaflet, some fill in the blanks on some key takeaways from this sermon. So we look first at the three most important points about Mary I think we should remember from today. Mary was a role model for a woman who was a human being with the utmost of character and her purity. Number two, as we learn, she was totally obedient to God and set the example for all of us to surrender to God's purpose and mission in life for us. And three, and finally, as we get distracted in life every day, we must keep in mind that the only way to our Father in heaven is through our devotion to Jesus, just like Mary's total devotion to Jesus. A final thought before I go to prayer. By our faith in what is written in the scriptures that we just reviewed, we are certainly certain of these events that led to the birth of our Savior to this woman of character, obedience, and devotion to her Lord. Thank God I was introduced to this so I got the real truth when I opened God's mouth. Did you ever stop to think of this young teenage girl, 13, 14, we're not certain, somewhere in there, 
her surprise visit by the angel Gabriel, overwhelming fact that she would be the one carrying the Messiah to full term and born to Mary. Young girls in this era knew that somebody was going to have the Messiah. They knew from their understanding of the Old Testament. And certainly in Mary's case, she knew. What did she know? Did Mary know that her baby would one day walk on water? Did she know that the son of hers would save all sons and daughters, including her? Did Mary know this little baby would grow to perform miracle after miracle after miracle and be the only perfect boy man to live on this planet? So if we talk to Mary, we could ask her, did you know that when you kiss this baby, you'd be kissing the face of God? Let us pray. Father, we feel a little bit like we've been there. Right there at the moment of the most wonderful, glorious event in all of human history, the hope of the world, the desires of the nations, the long-awaited Messiah of Israel, the one who would conquer all and come to save us. Without fanfare, the angel appeared and said, Mary, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. You shall name him Jesus. He'll be great. He'll be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And with that, our God, the great Redeemer, is coming. We thank you, Lord, for your word lives, how it moves our hearts, how it brings the, bears the ring of truth, how it compels us to be glorious, majestic, supernatural, profound simplicity of the story, a story so simple and so clear that even when a child little child could understand and so profound that all the wisdom in the world can fathom it. Oh God, we thank you that you came into this world, that God the Son was born to redeem all of us, including Mary, his mother. We thank you that our lives are a bit like hers. The divine messenger has brought us the gospel, not an angel, but some messer, some preacher, some teacher, some writer, even those who write the scriptures. And the divine messenger brought us a message that you made a divine choice before the foundation of the world to give us grace and to come with us, bless us. Mary's story is really our story. Oh, we can't all be oblivious to the fact that the special service was rendered to you of bearing the Christ, not us. That would only belong to Mary. But while we cannot bear Christ in our wombs, we can bear Christ to the world around us. We cannot give birth to him. We can surely take him in and glory of his gospel everywhere we speak, everywhere we live. Mary is one of us, unworthy and spectacular, unspectacular, without merit, without achievement. She is and was chosen, given a message, given grace to bear the Son of God. May we, Father, as she brought the child forth, may we bring forth in our word, worlds that this glorious life, death, resurrection, and gospel may bring light and life to the world. We pray in his name mightily. Amen. So today we are, just a moment, we're going to invite you to come to the table to take the elements of bread and juice and take them back to your seat and we'll eat them together. Just as a reminder, administratively, we will not be collecting cards Prayer requests are important. We need to have them. And so instead of collecting them today during communion, we'll have, them, have you put them in the basket as you depart, uh, as Zach Fowler already mentioned. 